Each year, one in five U.S. adults experience mental illness, and 17% of youth ages 6 to 17 experience a mental health disorder. I joined NAMI because I have two sons that live with a mental illness, and I didn't want any other families to feel alone like I did. At NAMI, the first thing we want anyone to know is you are not alone in your mental health journey. I just really want to talk about so so people know that, that you don't have to go through it alone. NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. We started as two moms, gathered around a kitchen table in 1979. And today, we are an alliance of more than 600 local affiliates and 48 state organizations who work in your community to raise awareness, build advocacy, and provide support and education. NAMI envisions a world where all people affected by mental illness live healthy, fulfilling lives supported by a community that cares. Every year we are expanding, no matter race, religion, age, or sexual identity. We are people with lived experience, families and loved ones, survivors and advocates. And together, we will fight the stigma surrounding mental health and create a better world for the sake of all of us. We have resources for you and can't wait to become an extension of your family. We are here for a healthier world. We are here for better mental health. We are here for each other. Join us. Hello again, John Pulaski here, host of the NAMI programs that we do here at Community 7 about uh, mental health and awareness of what's going on in that industry. Well, today I have two guests that are kind of part of two separate agencies that combine together with NAMI doing the work of trying to make everybody healthy mentally. Rod Ostermiller, who is the director of the Mental Health Center. Rod, welcome. Thank you, John. Great to be here. And Carmen, who is with the PAC team. PAC team mm -hmm. of that whole situation. I'm sorry, I get kind of confused there a little bit. No, nope, you're good. Um, we're going to talk about how each one of those play into the overall thing of mental health and betterment along the way. And Carmen, why don't we start with you talking about what is PACT? I know it's an acronym. Can we break it apart and talk about what it is and how it can help? You bet. You bet. So um, the acronym PACT actually stands for Program for Assertive Community Treatment. Um, and it was a program developed um, as a result of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, there was a lot of deregulation that happened in the 60s and 70s. And whereas we used to take, you know, this faction of folks who were experiencing severe um, mental illness and our solution to that problem was to put them into state hospitals all over. Mm -hmm. And so while Montana still does have a state hospital that is in operation, um, the solution to that was there has to be a better way um, for these folks to live and thrive in our communities. And so these PACT programs um, were developed and essentially we serve as a hospital without walls. And so what we do in the community is um, we, are, we are taking care of meeting their needs on a daily basis. So things like medication management. We're out in the community and we're making sure that they get their meds delivered to them. We're making sure that ultimately they stay um, mentally well, but we're also concerned about their physical well-being um, because historically, um, this population in particular, there are a lot of side effects that happen as a result of the psychotropic medications that they're on. And so what we do as a PAC team is we wrap our services around these folks from everything from medication management to uh, we have therapists on staff, we have peer support folks on staff, we have a licensed addiction counselor on staff. Um, and so there's about, and of course then we have our medical providers that meet with them on a monthly basis. So under this PACT model, we have about 19 full-time positions and, and 
essentially everything from activities of daily living and making sure that they get their grocery shopping done to making sure that they make it to their medical appointments. All of those things are wrapped under this one umbrella. We speak of they being the clients. Correct. Where do they come from and how does somebody find out more about what you do? Sure. Sure. So we have referrals that come in from all kinds of sources. So um, let's just start with the state hospital example. Um, if someone were committed to a state hospitalization stay for a period of time, a lot of times we will then get contacted by a social worker working with that person at the state level needing some type of step down service um, to assist and support this person in transitioning back into the community. Mm -hmm. We might also get that call from one of the hospitals um, who are looking at some type of discharge plan for this person. We may get that call from other community partners like the crisis center, like NAMI, like um, St. Vincent de Paul, Montana Rescue Mission, things like that. So mm -hmm. all of our community okay. partners also are aware that we exist. Um, and, you know, they, they come into um, those experiences quite often, you know, where even people who are experiencing homelessness, um, you know, they will tell you that, you know, 80% of the time there's also some type of mental health challenge that they're facing simultaneously. So the referrals come in like that, but we also might have, um, you know, I spoke to earlier in our side conversation about a phone call directly from a family member, um, you know, that uh, they, they've been trying to manage the situation on their own, um, they're not having a lot of success with it, or it's, it's pulling from them um, emotionally and sometimes physically so much that they just need that extra support and they need that degree of separation so that they can be the family member, they can be the mom, they can be the dad, um, but then also allow their child, you know, this autonomy that they really, every parent wants to give their child mm -hmm. in life. And so we can then step in and assist them with, you know, whether it's, um, finding and maintaining independent housing. You know, we have case managers also that are working within the group that, that really target the daily needs and living needs of these clients. How big a geographic area are you responsible for? So we are responsible for, we work within the city limits of Billings and that just basically has to do with logistics of what we are able to handle because we go on these med runs you know, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. We deliver in the morning and in the evening. Not to everybody, not both times a day, but um, logistically we have to think about that. Um, and all of the community resources that we have are really, you know, more concentrated within even the downtown Billings area. Um, and so um, we, we service just the people, you know, within the city limits. If I'm a parent or a family member, how would I contact you to talk about the services that you have available? Um, most people, what they do is they just call our main number, um, the 252-5658 number, and just visit with the front desk. They know how to direct those calls because um, usually I'll, I'll come in and I'll have a voicemail. It, it lands in my voicemail. If it's somebody who, you know, has either heard of packed services, has attended NAMI, or can give, you know, some type of background on the things that they're experiencing, mm -hmm. that call will usually end up with me. Um, everybody within our office knows that, that my role within the organization is, you know, onboarding new clients coming on to PACT and really working on that developmental piece and, and transitioning them in, um, you know, so that they feel supported coming on with services. Okay, so if I was to call information, mm -hmm. what, what would I ask for to get the number to call you? What's your name? Oh, my name, my no. name, as far as the my name role. of the organization. Oh, that, PACT. P-A-C? P-A-C-T, P-A-C-T, okay. PACT program. Okay. Yep, yep. Website? mhcbillings.org. Okay. So that would then will transition to you of mm -hmm. kind of, are you the parent of all of these kinds of things, Rod? Tell us what, 
what your role is. Well, John, I'm, I'm the CEO of, of the Mental Health Center, and of course, we're a regional organization. Um, our PAC team focuses yes. strictly on the, the city of Billings, but our organization as a whole, we cover 10 counties in South Central Montana. Oh. So we have uh, 93 employees, and our, our service area goes from here through Roundup, through Winnet, uh, Roundup, um, I did mention Roundup, um, Lewistown, mm -hmm. all the way up to Stanford, mm -hmm. and, and back down through Golden Valley County, down to Big Timber, uh, Columbus, and Red Lodge. And so we have a very large service area. Uh, we have offices in here, Roundup, Lewistown, Big Timber, and Columbus, and Red Lodge. And so uh, we provide outpatient services uh, for mental health, addiction, treatment services, things of that nature. In a, just a wide array of, mm -hmm. of, of different mm -hmm. programs that we provide for residents throughout that area. Um, one thing I will say about the PAC team, John, is it really is probably the most incredible thing currently operating in our community that's probably the most helpful and the most meaningful. Um, and when I say mm -hmm. that, it, it really creates an awful lot of value for our community in the state of Montana. Um, we look at ways that we can improve the lives of our clients, their families, make our community stronger in the process, and, mm -hmm. and hopefully keep people out of emergency rooms, keep them out of our jails and our prisons, keep them out of the state hospital. Those are very costly things for the taxpayers to sure. run. Yep. And we believe we can provide value by providing good quality care to our clients. And it really has a ripple effect throughout our community. And so we're very proud of that. And one thing I would like to stress is this is a 24-7, 365-day-a-year mm -hmm. program. We have people that are out there working on Thanksgiving, on Christmas, just mm -hmm. working hard to make mm -hmm. a difference in the lives of sure. others. And so, you know, I, I can't stress it enough how much value we bring to our community through our PAC team. Mm -hmm. Any quick success stories that you've had? That you well, you know, I, and I think, and I think Carmen can probably speak to this better than I can, but, you know, our goal ultimately is, mm -hmm. is to get people stabilized and hopefully get to the point where they can go and live independently. Mm -hmm. But always knowing they can call us mm -hmm. whenever they're in times of need mm -hmm. and uh, we can respond. But Carmen, do you yeah. have a success story? Well, and sometimes, you know, the intent of PACT um, is not... The intent of PACT is rehabilitation, really, and so it's it's empowering these clients, um, whether we're seeing them through a transition in life, whether they are, you know, it's, it's more of the onset of all of this and they're trying to reconcile, you know, what life looks like from here on out. Um, I can tell you, you know, one story of um, and, and this was this was a client that um, had been being seen by one of our providers for years, but she lived in an entirely different county. And she had some things in her own personal life that whatever whatever had happened, she had ended up in um, the psychiatric unit at Billings Clinic. And when she was going to be discharged, she wanted to stay in this area. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a real challenge because she had lived under the roof of her parents for her entire life. And we're talking someone who is in their late forties. And so we, we interviewed her and we, we brought her on and, and we've been able to support her in such a way. And, and I think that's the, that's the reward on our end, is that when we see those things clicking and we see somebody for the first time make those decisions that um, are in alignment with taking care of themselves and you see that empowerment piece and you see um, you know, their eyes light up because they're doing those things, they're taking care of themselves, they're finding their own housing with the assistance and the support of us, mm -hmm. but showing them the ways that, you know, a diagnosis is not your identity. A diagnosis is a part of who you are, but it would be no different than, you know, someone who was diagnosed with diabetes. I mean, diabetes is not going away, right? And so what we're trying to show them is how to navigate life from this place, knowing that this is a small piece of you, but it does not define you. 
Um, and so putting those pieces in place for her, helping her get transitioned into permanent housing, finding her the community resources in a community that she's never been exposed to before um, is really, it's really rewarding. It's rewarding to see, um, you know, to see them light up. Um, recently, I just, you know, I probably my own personal um, success story is um, I just helped a man transition through a divorce. He was married for 25 years and he had been supported in that family unit for 25 years and now helping him to navigate on his own and we have him we have him permanently housed and he's learning how to you know how to manage his illness from this place wow. you know on his own and um, you know sitting with him through um, court hearings and um, you know working with the parenting plan with his attorney and things like that and and hearing him speak from a place of such insight about his own illness um, but yet showing up and navigating those things of life, you know, it's, it's amazing to watch. We talked about cost a little bit sure. aside, mm -hmm. and you said Medicaid usually will cover if people are in that program. Yeah. Um, what if they're not? What do we do then? Well, if they're not, but they are deemed eligible, then usually what we do, because we certainly don't want to turn anyone away sure, who is in that. need. Mm -hmm. And so we have, because we have such a large organization, um, usually in a case like that, what I do is I welcome them in and just say, come in, let's have a conversation. I set them up as a client of the mental health center and we get them st established with services first, again, so that person is not falling between through the cracks, Great. basically. So we can set them up with a medical provider to begin with and then we just start putting the puzzle together and we assist them with, if it's Medicaid that they need to get on, whatever the case is, we go in and do that case management piece you know, and work with them. Um, that's, you know, the challenge in navigating all of these great programs that are available is people don't necessarily know that they're out there, nor do they know how to navigate them. Right, well that's why we're trying to do this yes. program too. precisely. Along the way. How is the mental health uh, service funded? Where does that come from? Well, John, uh, about 95% of our revenue comes from public sources. So either Medicaid, Medicare, we have a very strong um, uh, program. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of programs designed for veterans as well. So we get a lot of payments through the VA system as well. Okay. Um, you know, you make a good point when you talk about, you know, what if you don't have the resources or, or you don't qualify for Medicaid? One thing that I would like to stress is we don't turn anyone away. Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, we have rules when it comes to our programs. And so one thing that we try to do is we try to promote accountability with all of our clients, regardless of what program they're oh, in. Sure. Because unless you have account, if you don't have accountability, then you're ultimately not going to have success. And so we're not here to provide anybody with handouts. You have to work when mm -hmm. you get in our programs. You have to show improvement. You have to follow our rules. Um, if you don't, then perhaps, you know, there's another program in some other organization that would be a better fit for you. But ultimately, in an effort to make people better, promote accountability, and generate value, again, that's a word that we mm -hmm. use quite a bit, mm -hmm. we have to hold people accountable and they have to follow the rules that we lay down for them. And so, uh, just because you don't fall into a certain category where you can get paid you know, you can get payment through Medicaid or anything like that. Doesn't mean we're going to turn you away. Our doors are open to everyone in need. Mm -hmm. Great. So, it, I guess uh, uh, correlate the. How long can you be served by your group? You know, when somebody says, "I went to a treatment center that was six weeks, eight weeks, or whatever." Mm. What's the time frame with you guys? We certainly have goals under the PACT model um, that we're looking. You know. Um, the regulatory review boards that look at our program, they would like to see, they want to see number one, some kind of progress, you know, that we're making with clients, but they would like to see some graduation of, 
you know, betterment within, you know, 12 to 18 months is usually the goal. And it really depends on all of the things that have happened prior to them showing up with us. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are many things that can set, um, set someone back, you know, from making better progress. The more, the more episodes that they may experience, things like that, before they've come to us is certainly going to affect those outcomes. Um, but that's what we're looking for at all times. And because we are reviewed, you know, um, by the state, um, you know, we have to show signs of improvement sure. with our clients. Mm -hmm. And and that outlook is going to be different for everybody, you know, that comes and sees us. I mean, there's all kinds of factors that could come at play, you know, if we're, if we're dealing with some type of, you know, substance use simultaneously. Sometimes it's harder to um, get the stabilization piece that we're looking for. You know, there's challenges mm -hmm. in all of that. If we were to talk about the mental health of Montana, mm. Yellowstone County, Billings. <laughs> sure. Give us a ranking of what some of the problems are and where you have the most difficulty. Uh, I think, John, that the biggest challenge that we have is access. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, our service area is very rural. I mean, Billings is, is obviously the centerpiece for us because it's the largest urban center in the state of Montana. Um, mm -hmm. But we also serve a lot of counties, you know, such as Petroleum. They don't even have a thousand residents. Mm -hmm. How do you get services to the folks that live in that county? You know, and that's one thing that we're trying to trying to figure out right now. How do we get that done? How do we get the outcomes that we we want and, and those families need? Um, you know, we look at our ag communities right now. They're under a lot of stress. You know, financially, it's a very tough time to operate a a farm and a ranch. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we deliver services to those folks? And so we rely a lot on technology. We do a lot of telehealth. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a, a computer that you can sit in front of, then we have the ability to communicate with you. Wow. It's, it's not as good, mm -hmm. obviously, as mm -hmm. being in, in person, but it's good enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so we focus a lot on that. Access is a huge issue. One thing that we're always dealing with is the stigma associated with, with receiving help, yeah. whether it's for a mental health issue or you know, an addiction issue. By the way, they're co-occurring about 95% of the time, mm -hmm. which is pretty prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, so we consistently as a society need to find ways to reduce that stigma. And there's nothing wrong with needing help. At one point in time, everyone mm -hmm. throughout their lives needs help. And uh, mm -hmm. so we need to make, we need to fight that battle every day. People need to know mm -hmm. they can come get help anytime. Of how to reach out. Now, I think you and I had talked, and I brought the note with me about a new 911 is one way to call for help. But isn't there a new number that is used for mental health in specific that we can pass along? 988. Mm -hmm. Brand new number. Um, okay available 24 7 and mm -hmm. uh, they have the ability to to address uh, mm -hmm. people who are in crises at that time and also have the ability to make a referral great new resource mm -hmm. long overdue mm -hmm. excellent long okay. overdue yep i'm glad we brought that up because i remember talking to you about that and with all of the suicide and other mm -hmm. things that have seemed to take over a big portion of our agricultural community, it's pretty heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Montana ranks, I believe, in the top five in suicide. Yes. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. Because it's tough when you have, that's a lifestyle unto its own, yeah. that you're independent, you don't need help, you get her done, but sometimes you can't. So I guess the emphasis is that we, you know, if we can put that word out, that if you need help or you know somebody that may need some help, that these services mm -hmm. are available to do well, that. Well, and I think, you know, too, speaking to the isolative piece, you know, I mean, if you, you talk about people in agriculture, it's a very isolating line of work, too. And, and that goes hand in hand with what we're dealing with every day. Um, you know, one of, one of the biggest components of mental health is isolation. And, um, 
you know, coming on the heels of the pandemic, where I think that all of us in general can relate to that and, and what isolation does to a person, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that much more need, you know, for mental health services out there. And it's exacerbated um, some of the symptoms that people were already experiencing as a result. So now trying to, you know, plug people back into these <clears throat> services and, and get them to show up and things like that. I mean, we have some work ahead of us in that regard. Certainly. We mm -hmm. really are dealing with the perfect storm right now. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. I mean, condition, yeah. it's tough out there for people. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So just kind of a recap again. We have PACT, which mm -hmm. again, the acronym is for? Program for Assertive Community Treatment. Okay. Yeah. And that is an umbrella with a, a huge amount of services and yeah. people to help, yes. right? Correct. And then the mental health center, give us a recap again of what and how that works. Well, the mental health center has many programs under our roof. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we provide outpatient services in the form of therapy. We have a, a full medical staff. We have a, a couple of psychiatrists, several uh, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners. We have a, a small army of therapists. Mm -hmm. We have some addiction counselors. We have a, a, a team that, again, an acronym, our PATH team, mm -hmm. <laughs> deals with the homeless, uh, deal with the working poor a lot. Very important at this point in time with what's going on in housing, mm -hmm. you know, with the shortage we're, we're oh. experiencing there. Mm -hmm. We also have a group home um, where we can uh, transition people to, and hopefully, again, we talk about outcomes an awful lot in our organization ultimately get them to the right place so they can go out on their own and live independently. We have a, a day treatment facility that helps people with skill building and, and again, prepares them um, to enter the workforce, to enter society, and, and, and I, I guess provide uh, to contribute to society overall. So we, we do have an awful lot of programs and they're complementary. Yes. That's and so we can we can take someone from the PAC team and maybe mm -hmm. transition them to our group home with the goal of ultimately getting them out and in, living independently in our community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it really is neat. It's really a, a fascinating organization. Prior to coming here, I had no I idea that it existed. But the more I, the more I, I, I work with people like Carmen and all the professionals that, mm -hmm. that are employed in our organization, the more I realize the extremely important piece that we play in our community. You know, keeping people out of emergency rooms, out of jails and prisons, it's extremely important. And uh, not only makes difference in the lives of people, but it's awful easy on the pocketbook too, when you talk about taxpayers oh. and, and mm -hmm. how much they have to pay and foot the bill when it comes to things like the emergency room and prisons and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. really an incredible organization. I'm really, really honored to be part of it. Super. Mm -hmm. Rod Ostemiller, Carmen Hedges, mm -hmm. want to thank you for being here today. And on behalf of NAMI, being a part of the work with mental illness, uh, I want to thank the audience for joining us today. And we'll hope to have you back soon to talk and explore more avenues. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. You.